Well, welcome to Field Trip Friday. I understand people are logging in. We'll have about a five minute uh, time where people can log in. And we're happy to welcome Harrison Jack Schmidt to Field Trip Friday today. And in just a few minutes, he's got a prepared slideshow and I'm sure you're all gonna enjoy it. So we'll just take a few minutes here as everybody logs in. Charles, would you like to talk and uh, say anything? Well, it's Friday and it's time for a field trip. For those of us who are uh, can't get out and look at the rocks in person, uh, grab your hammer and off we go on another adventure. And we're lucky to have someone who actually put his boots on the moon. That's another celestial body. So um, it's a great privilege to have Dr. Harrison Jack Schmidt. Jack, I just want to say before we get started, a big thank you to you for uh, finding time for this program and your busy schedule. And, and a big thank you for all you've done for APG and HGS and geoscientists uh, by sharing your experiences. And we really appreciate it. And uh, APG Jack is an honorary member of APG. Uh, one of the uh, highest awards is the Harrison Jack Schmidt Award at APG. And uh, Jack has taken groups of geoscientists to the Space Center in 2006, 2011, 2014, 2017. And gosh, God willing, we hope to be going back again sometime in the future. Well, I hope that works out. Uh... Charles, it's, uh, it's really a great privilege for me to be with you two again, and uh, I look forward to talking to the group. Well, one of the big features of Space Center Houston is the Apollo 17 capsule is on display. And every time you go back and take a look at the capsule, I mean, what are your thoughts as you, as you look in there? I mean, do memories come back, or does it just seem like a piece of hardware? Or what, what do you think about when you look inside that capsule? Well, I never, I never have a chance to... Uh, not have the memories. And uh, I, the last time I was there was when the Apollo 11 capsule was also at the Space Center Houston. Unfortunately, uh, they did not bring them two together out on the main floor. Uh, there were all sorts of excuses for not doing that, but they, it's too bad that they weren't together, the first and the last capsule. Wow. Well, that's one of our favorite exhibits. And also the moon rock, when you walk into the lunar vault down at Space Center Houston, there's a moon rock in there and some moon rock displays. And we always enjoy going down there. And uh, now that particular rock is on display in a many different places. And uh, it's the one at the Smithsonian, of course, that you can touch. And it's been worn smooth by <laughs> the people who have touched it. Uh, and it is an countless pictures. In, it's an interesting rock in itself. It's one of the few uh, uh, very fine grain basaltic rocks that we found that uh, may have been near the top of a lava flow when it formed. Uh, we just didn't see many of those because those lava flows are uh, almost four billion years old and uh, the tops have been destroyed. Wow. Well, I just want to welcome, we have a lot of people signing in. Uh, please use the uh, Q&A for questions at the end of our presentation by Dr. Schmidt. Please use Q&A. If you have a technical problem, please use chat. So we'll be check checking Q&A and also chat throughout this, but uh, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, this is a webinar thing, so please use Q&A for questions. And uh, we have a really good presentation ready to go. We are only two minutes past, or just after one, so, or 11, I mean. So we, we're waiting for some people to arrive. I don't want to start too early. We said 11, and some people are still uh, getting their screens booted up. But uh, this is a real privilege to have Jack on the call. And as Charles was saying earlier, um, he is an honorary member of the AAPG and does a lot with the AAPG. And there's an astrogeology committee, which he has been a, a member of for many years. And, participants. He also has a book. Do I have the book? It's an APG memoir. I have a book. Wait a minute. Where, where is my, my thing is not showing up on the screen. But there, there is an APG book for sale, APG Memoir 101, Energy Resources for Human Settlement in the Solar System and Earth's Future in Space. So are you, are you working on any new books at all? Uh, 
I'm always working on a book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right now, the, uh, the main thing I'm doing is trying to get my uh, diary of the 12th man onto the internet and then maybe eventually published. Uh, oh, got, wow. Uh, that, uh, that's on the, uh, my website, which is americasuncommonsense.com. Okay. Uh, americasuncommonsense.com. Dot com. Okay. Well, we will send America. out links and we'll get that on there. So the new book is a diary? It's a diary of the mission. And everything that, can, and as much as I can, uh, the things that came before and a little bit that came after. And, you know, a lot of that's recorded, those recordings of the interchanges between all the astronauts and mission control or something that you can access on NASA if you want to hear. I'm sure that that form a lot of your research and then personal notes as well. Well, it's mainly the material uh, that I have in my brain and also uh, some of the uh, files that I have kept through the years. Uh, I, think, uh, I think people will enjoy it, but it's uh, like most diaries, it's hard to read. Uh, because the subjects keep changing. Uh, but I've tried to use color coding in order to make that a little bit easier. Wow, we look forward to, what would be a publication date for this? Any, any idea, like six months or? No, <laughs> no, it's going on the internet right uh, now, at, at chapter by chapter. Oh, okay. Well, we will oh, it's definitely. Available. I, yeah, uh, AmericansUncommonSense.com. And just, look, uh, just uh, right on the uh, first page, you'll see, uh, diary, the Diary of the Twelfth Man. Wow. And then the uh, chapters that are published are indicated. Wow. Well, I think we are just a few minutes past 11. Why don't we kind of start to wind it up? We, I have, I have 50 attendees and we had 71 and a few extra added on. So I think we could probably get rolling with your introductory comments. And uh, you, we're sharing Jack's screen. The, our speaker today is Harrison Jack Schmidt, Apollo 17 Lunar Module Pilot. And he's going to talk about field trip to the moon. And he, we are actually sharing his screen. So Jack, you have the calm, the control. Go forward as you want. <laughs> okay. Lift off. Well, the first thing I, I, I want to show you is a cartoon that I think is really one of my favorites. Uh, it, it, it says, try to look inconspicuous, one sample talking to another. Yeah. One of those things picked up your Uncle Rick once, and he was never heard <laughs> from again. And uh, when, uh, during the Apollo 11 anniversary celebration, NASA had me and Jessica Watkins, uh, the new geologist astronaut, uh, down at the uh, rock lab, the uh, lunar receiving laboratory, as we used to call it. And guess what? There was Uncle Rick. Uh, just waiting <laughs> for, uh, and uh, again, and uh, one of those things happened to be doing it. So uh, it was it was a lot of fun to be with Jessica, and we we had a great time looking at various samples and talking about uh, the future collection that she may undertake in Artemis. The uh, Apollo space program uh, it's worth I think reviewing very quickly what it consisted of. Of course, landing on the moon was proposed by President Kennedy in 1961 uh, to counter uh, the, the Soviet advances in human spaceflight at the time. Uh, and it was a major competition in the Cold War. It, it, that was, the, we, we just have to remember that uh, science was, uh, was a passenger on this uh, program. Uh, and the Cold War with the Soviet Union was the primary impetus of it. As, uh, as you recall, Apollo 8 orbited the moon in uh, 1969, 8, uh, around Christmas. And it, uh, Neil Armstrong then successfully landed on the moon on July 20th, 1969, uh, 51 years ago this year. And that effectively ended the moon race. Uh, however, uh, the uh, uh, Soviet emigres have often told me that the moon race really ended the first time we launched a Saturn V and did it successfully. They knew that the, the whole thing was over then. Uh, and so uh, Neil just uh, put the frosting on that cake uh, with respect to the Cold War objectives of the uh, Apollo program. Now there were five additional Apollo missions that landed on the moon between uh, November uh, of, uh, of 1969 and December of 1972. Uh, 
Apollo 13, uh, one of the more exciting as, and, and, and more accomplished of the missions, uh, was damaged by the, an explosion, but rescued in April of 1970. Unfortunately, their 50th anniversary uh, was not celebrated significantly this year because of the pandemic and the political activities that have been undertaken in that context. Uh, the last three Apollo missions each explored different areas on the moon, uh, uh, and they, each of them for three days, uh, three uh, excursions each time. Uh, that, uh, those missions were truly science missions. They were exploration missions and uh, went to uh, three uh, very significant parts of the moon. Of course, we haven't even begun to explore the moon fully uh, as only six missions have landed. Uh, however, the samples that we, we uh, retrieved on those missions total about 850 pounds and, uh, of, of rocks and soils, and uh, they were brought back to Earth, and they are indeed uh, continued to be studied today. Uh, I heard just yesterday that uh, there, there have been uh, uh, some, there are still some 400 scientists working on these samples around the world, mostly in the United States. It is truly the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, there were scientific experiments also left uh, at six sites on the moon. Uh, they provided uh, uh, geophysical information about the interior of the moon. Unfortunately, uh, today you could not reactivate those sites because the power source, a plutonium power source would have uh, run down to a point where they just uh, would not be able to activate those samples. Uh, the data was collected until 1977, and we do have from that data a significant amount of geophysical understanding of the interior of the moon. Uh, and uh, people often ask me, uh, why, why understand the moon scientifically? Well, primarily because it's the early history, it's understanding the early history of the Earth. Uh, the Earth is so dynamic geologically, as you all know, that uh, most, uh, mo essentially all of that early history has disappeared, at least so far as we've been able to uh, look at it. There is one aspect of that early history that we are looking at increasingly in the last decade or two, uh, and that is the history of zircons uh, that have been found in Australia and Canada and, uh, and Africa in the very, very old Precambrian rocks of the earth. Those zircons seem to record some of the uh, early history and uh, have become very important in uh, connecting the Earth to the moon, but not nearly as important as our general understanding of the moon today. So uh, with this particular field trip that we're on today, Apollo 17, we used the Saturn V uh, rocket, it was truly a magnificent and very robust rocket system. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the Johnson and the Nixon administrations agreed that they would only uh, buy 15 of these rockets. And so there was a limit to how many missions could go to the moon. Uh, and however, we used all but three of these rockets uh, in various ways and other aspects of the program. The three missions were canceled that would have followed Apollo 17. The spacecraft uh, command module Apollo, in this case, the America, is in the upper right of your screen. And uh, the Challenger lunar module that landed on the moon is in the lower right. Both extremely uh, fine spacecraft. We had, for our particular mission, unlike uh, other Apollo missions, we had no essential, no significant anomalies. They were indeed uh, very well tested, very well put together, and really a remarkable tribute to the 450,000 Americans that were part of Apollo. I, I show this picture not to illustrate how, uh, how my uh, appearance has changed in uh, 50 years, but to show you another spacecraft. I showed you the command module, uh, command and service module, and the lunar module. This is our, uh, what's called the EMU, the extravehicular mobility unit, uh, the, uh, the suit, which with a backpack allowed us to spend uh, up to uh, seven and a half hours uh, outside a spacecraft on the surface of the moon three different times on this field trip. Uh, it, is, uh, it is truly though a spacecraft. It uh, provides, it provided with the backpack, uh, the uh, oxygen and cooling that we needed in order to operate, as well as communications uh, and uh, emergency supplies of oxygen if, we were, if they were needed. 
uh, the uh, uh, really, uh, this suit is really remarkable. It was put together at the International Latex Corporation, ILC, in, in Denver, Delaware, by, uh, in uh, 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 Dover, Delaware, in, by uh, uh, the seamstresses that uh, previously had been making, uh, shall we say, the unmentionables for people, for women throughout the world. Uh, they really did a remarkable job, Ter wonderfully dedicated people. Now, it took us three and a half days to get to the moon, and so I'm going to skip just to the field area. And this you see from the lunar module on the orbit prior to our landing, uh, the Valley of Taurus Littrell. This valley is about 50 uh, uh, kilometers long, about four and a half kilometers wide at its narrowest point where we landed, and that was there. Uh, and those mountains on either side rise in the, in the south, rise to uh, uh, 2,100 meters, and on the uh, north to about 1,600 meters. Uh, and so this valley is actually deeper than the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. Uh, really a remarkable uh, feature on any planet and certainly so remarkable for the moon. The uh, America Command and Service Module is uh, ahead of us and below us. Uh, about a mile at this uh, point, and Ron Evans, the, uh, it was alone in that spacecraft at the time, and was actually taking navigational sightings on small craters near our landing site, the position of which we knew relative to the center mass of the moon, primarily because of an early uh, robotic mission called Lunar Orbiter that uh, allowed us to determine the position of those craters relative to that center of mass. Uh, I don't, I didn't take any pictures on the way down to the landing site and, and once we landed, this is the first picture I could take, uh, looking uh, out to the North Massif, the 1600 meter high uh, wall of the uh, valley at this point. It is about three, uh, three and a half miles to the base of that massif. And this is a very typical uh, surface of the moon over basaltic lava flows that have been in place uh, in this case from about 3.7 billion years ago. And so there's a, a fairly thick layer of debris that's developed due to meteor impact and micrometeor impact and also solar wind sputtering of the individual particles. And that, uh, that debris layer called the regolith is in this uh, average is about nine or 10 meters deep in, a, in this particular part of the moon. Uh, what it takes in order to explore the moon is, of course, a spacecraft to get you there, but serves also as your camp. A uh, very comfortable camp, as a matter of fact. I recommend 1.6G to any field geologist that can, get, can access it. Uh, it also, uh, this photograph shows you the transportation we used on the moon, the lunar rover, the spacesuit now uh, fully uh, functional as a spacecraft with the astronaut uh, yours truly providing mobility uh, to it as we cr uh, worked on the surface. And then, of course, the flag of the United States um, commemorating our taxpayer who uh, allowed not only this victory in the Cold War, but also the initial scientific exploration of the moon. We had one uh, problem that uh, was somewhat significant, and that is uh, the commander uh, hooked a hammer he had in his pocket on uh, the uh, dust flap of this fender on the lunar rover, broke it off, and so we had to devise, or I should say mission control, had to devise a fix for that in order to keep dust from uh, actually giving us a forward rooster tail. Uh, in one six gravity, the, the rooster tail doesn't go backwards, it goes forward. And, uh, and some of that would rain down on, on all the equipment as well as the the crew that was driving it. Uh, this is one of the, my favorite pictures. It's a large boulder that had rolled about a kilometer and a half down the North Massif, one of, uh, of two major boulders that we studied and sampled. Uh, you're truly there for scale. You can see the size. As it hit a break in the slope of the uh, 26, basically 26 degree angle of repose of the Massif, it broke into five parts. And it all, that, in turn, gave us a chance to sample different parts of the boulder, different units within it. And uh, this boulder, as well as the one at the next station, uh, this was Station 6, and then at Station 7, 
uh, have provided it a little bit of stratigraphy uh, knowledge, stratigraphic knowledge of the units that are in the massif. Uh, that, that boulder uh, rolled down the mountain there probably about 25 million years ago. Uh, it, uh, however, formed as a melt breccia from a large basin forming impact about uh, 3.9 billion years ago. I use big numbers. Uh, now, if you look very closely, you may be able to see a light colored patch just below the tip of that arrow, and that's where the lunar module is. Uh, every landing on the moon winnowed away dark, the dark surface materials to the point of where you actually know where they landed by this uh, light colored patch of somewhat coarser green uh, materials. We'll see more of that in a moment. Uh, now, one of the uh, 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 more interesting uh, stations that we visited was Shorty Crater. Uh, Shorty Crater uh, formed about three million years ago. Uh, it exposed some pyroclastic ash, uh, which uh, sampled and was quite colorful. Uh, the, uh, uh, whoops, a little slow there. That, uh, let me get, let me get back here. Okay. It, uh, sorry about that. I've got to slow down my finger. Okay, that's the ash. Now, uh, the er pictures that originally were published on this uh, made it look uh, more gray. In fact, hardly any color at all. And I've worked with a, a good friend of mine, uh, the editor actually of that webpage I men mentioned, who is also very, uh, he and his son are very clever in the uh, uh, enhancement of photographs. And what we did was work with the transcripts and what, how I described the color of this pyroclastic deposit and, uh, and we're able to pull that information out of the color photographs, the ectochrome photographs that were, uh, we actually used on the moon. Uh, and this just gives you an idea of how colorful uh, that was. This is a very, very good reputation, re representation of what I actually saw uh, when I discovered this uh, deposit. Uh, this deposit for the pyroclastic eruptions were about three and a half billion years ago and uh, have given us some major information about the deep interior of the moon, the volatile content that drove these pyroclastic eruptions, as well as the composition of uh, some information about the composition of the uh, deep interior. Uh, now I'm going to jump over to a between EVA picture, between excursion picture, and show you uh, what the surface of the regolith looks like. You recall my early picture, it, looked, it was very undisturbed. And here you see how, uh, it, how quickly, in a, just a few hours, we were able to uh, disturb that surface and, uh, and make it look much more like a volleyball court on a beach, uh, in a, uh, on a beach somewhere, maybe Padre Island or someplace like that. The, uh, and that's going to be an issue for the uh, future settlements or our bases on the moon. They need to stabilize that surface because that uh, uh, fluffed up material will just get deeper and deeper. And that can be done. That can be done with um, rock aggregate or some other uh, uh, mechanism that uh, I'm sure we will figure out. Uh, and this is an awfully good picture, both of the, uh, the lunar rover and of the flag of the United States at the Apollo 17 site. Those uh, bright metallic objects in the, in the right foreground are small restartable rockets that we use to control the attitude of our spacecraft uh, while in flight. Uh, each one of those little rockets provided about 50 pounds of thrust. And I just will contrast that with a Saturn V rocket main engine, which had 1.5 million pounds of thrust. And there were several other propulsion systems in between so you can see that was one of the major technology developments of the Apollo program was to have this uh, spectrum of different kinds of space propulsion. Now the uh, regolith that is, was all fluffed up there and here you see me sampling uh, uh, is a uh, resource. Uh, it contains uh, 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 hundreds of uh, 100 or 200 parts per million hydrogen, helium, uh, carbon and nitrogen that have come from the sun as ions and then having been embedded because of their very high energy in the upper surfaces of the particles in the regolith. 
And it is that resource that uh, is of great interest, uh, potentially commercially, as well as uh, for the uh, uh, providing the necessary life support for a base or a settlement on the moon. Uh, one of those resources I've talked to APG about on several occasions is a light isotope of helium, uh, helium-3, that uh, is an ideal fuel for fusion power uh, if brought back to Earth, a clean uh, nuclear power without nuclear waste. So uh, we're still working on trying to get that, uh, get things put together so that that resource can be harvested and brought back to Earth. It also, interestingly enough, has a, a very important medical application. Helium-3, because of its shape as an atom, can be polarized and, and it provides an opportunity for extremely high resolution uh, of uh, human lungs and uh, diagnostic resolution. Uh, people may not realize it, but lung cancer is the worst form of cancer uh, that we have. Only 19% of people diagnosed with lung cancer uh, will survive it. Uh, however, early diagnosis means that the survival rate goes up into the 90s. Uh, so uh, the helium-3 has many other, has this other application uh, that uh, we're all looking forward to having someday. Uh, the undisturbed grade for helium-3 in this regolith is about 20 parts per million. At least uh, that's my estimate uh, it, <clears throat> for the recoverable grade. Uh, a thousand watt, uh, megawatt fusion power plant needs about 100 kilograms of helium-3 per year to operate. Uh, that, uh, that not very much when it comes to the amount of energy that is a thousand megawatt plant has, one gigawatt. Uh, and, however, a hundred megawatt fusion power plant only needs about 10 kilograms. And a hundred megawatt fusion power plant is, is a, has many current practical implica uh, applications, uh, primarily for these very high energy server uh, farms that are now uh, driving the internet that we're using here to chat. I'm not going to spend any more time on that because I've talked to you about it on several occasions. This just illustrates uh, that uh, we were indeed inside the uh, lunar module. I, it doesn't prove we were on the moon when this picture was taken, but take my word for it, we were. Leaving the moon uh, did not afford the opportunity to get a really good picture of our liftoff. This was, picture was taken off a TV screen. Uh, I've uh, recommended to Jessica Watkins that uh, they figure out a way to get a much better uh, TV system up there or at least uh, uh, stay a while and take some pictures of other spacecraft uh, landing and lifting off. Now, I, I enjoy this picture because it was taken by a spacecraft that is currently in orbit around the moon, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter or LRO. Uh, it, uh, they ha that uh, spacecraft has taken uh, high resolution images of each of the landing sites and this happens to be ours. And the object in the middle of the photograph there is the descent stage of the lunar module Challenger that was our launch pad when we left the moon. And you can see the uh, foot tracks as it goes out to the Apollo uh, scientific package site there on the right. And uh, also, uh, you can see the tracks of the lunar rover. And that gives you an idea of what the resolution of this picture is. You saw those wheels on the lunar rover, and you see their independent tracks. So the resolution is, is on the order of uh, uh, maybe 50 centimeters, but a little better than that even. Uh, you also can see in this picture that light-colored area around the landing where the dark, fine-grained material has been winnowed away by our the effluence from the descent engine. Well, this is what is left of the Challenger as we rendezvoused with Ron Evans uh, in the, uh, uh, after three days on the moon, uh, the ascent stage, and there's Ron uh, uh, showing uh, his very clever experiment uh, with some uh, food package. Uh, that uh, bubble in the food package is hydrogen. Uh, we, we produced our electricity and our water using hydrogen oxygen fuel cells. And somehow though, uh, the engineers never kept a little bit of the hydrogen from, from going over into the water supply. 
And so uh, if you ingest the water supply, you ingest hydrogen much eventually to the discomfort of your crewmates. And here Ron has succeeded uh, in aggregating most of that hydrogen into a single bubble. Uh, our experimental food of choice was salmon salad. Uh, salmon salad uh, tasted fine. I mean, it was okay, but it just doesn't travel well. You don't want to have fish that's uh, packaged and has been around for a while. It didn't spoil, but we just we always use it for experiments and not, not significantly for food. If you go to a museum and see a package of salmon salad, you know that's what we brought back, not, uh, not what we actually used. Well, we uh, re-entered the uh, Earth's atmosphere at about 25,000 miles an hour, uh, using the atmosphere to uh, dissipate the uh, kinetic energy of the uh, uh, spacecraft. And at about 10,000 feet, these big parachutes opened up automatically. We could have opened them uh, manually, but the uh, the computer system worked extremely well and made sure all of these things happened at the appropriate time. Our splashdown in the South Pacific uh, near the island of Samoa was uh, uh, uneventful in that uh, uh, there's not much of a shock. It's about the same as a, a sport parachute. 16 feet per second is our impact uh, velocity. And uh, But I'll tell you that spacecraft is not a very good boat and uh, probably the most uncomfortable I felt on the whole mission was waiting for the uh, the uh, Navy uh, SEALs, they actually were called UDT team teams at the time, underwater demolition teams, uh, to open the hatch and get us out. Well, as a, as a final slide, I just use this to uh, summarize everything that uh, at least the Apollo 17 mission meant and also uh, really the Apollo program. Sorry about that, the dark slides tend to disappear. And hang on. Well, let me take a look at the chat here while we're hang on. I got it. There you go. This, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the astronaut on the moon summarizes that, uh, you know, we needed human beings to make all of this happen. Uh, and uh, the flag, of course, uh, illustrates the value of the American ideas that made it all happen as well. So let's go ahead with the, uh, I'll try to find us, I'll put a slide up here that uh, okay. won't, won't leave us. And okay, uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Sure, we've got a couple questions. Charles, uh, are you muted or unmuted, Charles? I'm unmuted, I believe. Okay, well, you had a question. Let's take yours first. Yeah, so so while everybody, you're typing your questions in, we thought, uh, Jack, our, our thoughts are for the future generations. And we know that there is at least one young future astronaut tuning in today, a young lady named Fabienne from the Boston area. We've also um, recently, you've mentioned Jessica Watkins, uh, We've had the good fortune to get to know her a little bit at the HGS Scholarship Night last February. So I guess my question is, what advice would you have to the future astronauts like young Fabienne and, uh, and to Jessica Watkins? What things should they study in school? What are some of the things that you would like to see future generations do? Well, the, uh, the, this generation around today and, uh, and, and future generations are going to have some, I believe, some very uh, unique and exciting as well as valuable opportunities to, uh, to really inhabit the moon. Uh, now, they may go back and forth, but ultimately, I think you will see settlements on the moon, primarily uh, supporting the production of the resources that we talked about. Uh, and uh, so it's an exciting time for any young person uh, and not only uh, uh, possibly living on the moon, working there, but also using those resources on the moon to enable the uh, exploration of Mars. Uh, all of that is in the not too distant future uh, for these young people. And, and in, in order to prepare for that, there are many different career paths that now can be taken. Very early in the, uh, in the space program, the career path was being a, a, a highly accomplished test pilot or military pilot. Uh, 
Uh, then uh, I sort of broke the ice there on bringing scientists into the program. Uh, and it's, I, believe, I, I know some of my colleagues would not appreciate this comment, but it's a lot easier and, and, and quicker to, to make a competent a jet pilot out of a scientist than it is to make a scientist out of a jet pilot. Uh, and although we had a fantastic training program for the pilot astronauts, uh, the, they just, you just never can gain the 10 or 20 years of field experience uh, that is needed in order to really accomplish a great deal in exploration of the moon. Uh, so, uh, and now, and then with the space shuttle, all, all sorts of career paths opened up. Uh, and, uh, and so it's, the main thing is to be very, very good, study very, very hard, uh, in your career path, as well as knowing a lot on either side of it. Uh, just uh, study and experience are certainly the key things that young people have to do and have to gain in order to uh, uh, really be uh, in a position to be selected as a astronaut in the future. Well, here are some of our questions. Um, the HCS past president, uh, John Blickweed, has a question. He wanted to know, when you woke up on the moon after landing there for the first time, what was it like when you realized that you woke up on the moon? <laughs> well, you know, it, it, everything is moving so fast. Uh, that's a great question, but everything is moving so fast that the main thing you want to do is use every second as, as productively as you possibly can. And uh, the reflections, my reflections about being on the moon have, have come more later than they did at the time I was there. It was a beautiful place to be, a magnificent valley deep in the Grand Canyon, as I said. Uh, and, but uh, the first time I woke up on the moon, my main thought was let's get going and get out there for that second excursion. Uh, and because we, don't have, we only have 72 hours to be here and let's use them as best we can. Okay, uh, Will Kane is asking, what, what would be future geological experiments that you would like to see tested on a future lunar mission? Well, one, one of the main things we need to do with each future mission is, is put long duration geophysical packages out uh, so that we can uh, monitor the uh, internal activity within the moon. And there is internal activity, there are moon quakes. Uh, that can give us a great deal of information about the, uh, the uh, internal structure of the moon. But the primary aim of lunar exploration, as I said before, is to gather information about the early history of the Earth. And uh, we have gathered a significant amount of information about that, uh, but there's much more to be gained. We have to realize that these large impacts that form basins, in one case, 3,200 kilometers in diameter, were also happening on Earth. And they were happening on Earth at a time when uh, the complex molecules that ultimately uh, generated life forms were beginning to organize. Uh, and, and the impact debris may well be the source of the clays that allowed that organization to, uh, to occur. Uh, we don't know all of that yet, and there's a great deal more that we have to learn about that early history and about the environment in which life formed here on Earth. Well, one question we have here from Dallin Masterson is asking about the red ash flow. Was that oxidized by oxygen in the moon's atmosphere, or how did the uh, volcanic soil turn red? Well, it turns out that the red color is a is, is a byproduct of the iron titanium ratio in the glasses. Those are very small beads, glass beads. The iron titanium ratio uh, in those uh, rocks was such that it, those uh, ashes were such that it uh, uh, made, made the, those glass beads red. As soon as they start to be devitrify, that ratio changes because iron, the iron uh, in the early minerals that form in that glass uh, iron is uh, depleted and, uh, and it starts to change. Uh, similar glasses were found in the collection that was obtained by the Apollo 15 astronauts. Uh, and uh, those, gr those glasses have a lower titanium content and are green. So it has to do nothing. I thought it was oxidation when I was there because that's what I was used to seeing here on Earth with, with uh, volcanic materials. Uh, 
Uh, but no, indeed, it has to do with just the composition of the glass beads. We have a question from Diana about the solar wind. In fact, there's two questions sort of related to solar wind. And I know that's a, an interest of yours. So, you know, what portion of unlithi unlithified sediments are there that are the result of solar wind? Well, the solar wind, uh, which is composed of those elements that I mentioned earlier that are resources, uh, have a very high velocity, particularly after a coronal mass ejection or a solar flare, and they are capable of sputtering the surfaces of individual particles. And so all of the particles in the lunar regolith uh, that uh, have been exposed to the solar wind in the last uh, uh, 2.5 six billion years, and I'll explain that in a moment, uh, have a little very thin coatings of aluminosilicate glass uh, in which there is also a very fine-grained nanophase, we call it, iron, uh, native iron particles. And that is all, almost all of that is produced by the solar wind. Some of it by micrometeor impacts, but mostly by solar wind sputtering. Uh, and, uh, and it is in that uh, uh, the material that we find some of these resources uh, that have, are embedded in that glass. Uh, the, uh, the reason I said 2.6 uh, billion years ago is when that start, uh, all started is because the moon had a global ma uh, magnetic field uh, up until that about, at about that time. There was a core, a circulating core that produced a dynamo as we see it now. And, uh, and you had a, a global field up until about 2.6 billion years ago when the moon had cooled enough that that dynamo shut off. And so once that dynamo shut off, then the ions coming from the solar wind could impact the surface. When uh, the dynamo was active, uh, those uh, positive and negatively charged ions that uh, were coming from the sun were deflected by, the, by that uh, magnetic field. So would you comment a little bit on our return to the moon plans we hear about? Um, do you think NASA is going to be able to return to the moon by 2024 with a manned mission? Or what do you think about the plans for the Artemis uh, moon base? Well, to the degree that I have knowledge of their uh, the plans, uh, I'm not inside NASA, so I, don't, I know what people know that read uh, read about it uh, in the press and elsewhere. Uh, I think NASA has a real shot at landing on the moon in 2024. Whether ultimately they land uh, at the South Pole on the edge of a crater that has permanently shadowed uh, ice in it, uh, that's another question. Uh, as your members re recall, we did an awful lot of precursor missions before we actually uh, landed on the moon and began our exploration program. Not only were Mercury and Gemini important, but the, uh, the first four Apollo missions were important as well, eight through 11, in demonstrating and, and learning how to do this. Now, we, have, uh, we still know how to land on the moon, but we're doing it with new systems, with new technology, and uh, a new generation of young people who are going to make it happen. And it may well be NASA at some point uh, will decide, let's, this first mission, let's back off a little bit and, and make it a little less complicated uh, than what uh, landing at the South Pole on the edge of a, of a, of a large crater might be. Uh, so we'll just see. Uh, they, I'll tell you, you'd never under underestimate what young men and women can do uh, when they are motivated in order to do something. Apollo demonstrated that in space. We have several questions about going to Mars. Uh, I guess just generally, to, what's the time frame you really anticipate? Will we be back to the moon and have a moon base before we go to Mars as a civilization, or they'll be concurrently? Or do you have opinion? Is it worth it to go to Mars? What's your opinion? Well, I think Mars is the next uh, human uh, goal for for uh, for us uh, on planet Earth. I don't think there's any question about that, but. Uh, the Artemis program is just part of uh, a continuing, I hope it's part of a continuing uh, development of the capability and the resources necessary uh, to go to Mars. There's a lot we don't know about 
taking a mission to Mars and landing there. Um, landing on Mars is, is going to be uh, very difficult, much more difficult than Apollo. Uh, Mars has just enough atmosphere to cause problems and not enough to help you dissipate energy. Uh, there's a very short period of time between actually starting a descent to the Mars surface and getting there. Uh, it, it is a different kind of job, and we're going to have to learn using Moon on the best ways to do that. Also, uh, uh, we, I think we need interplanet uh, we need a, a fusion interplanetary uh, rocket system in order to shorten the time frame that uh, crews uh, take to get to Mars and are exposed to the solar wind and to solar flares and coronal mass ejections. Uh, uh, I don't know of any, uh, there are ways in order to mitigate some of the problems of the radiation that's imposed by not only the sun, but cosmic rays. Uh, but we still have a lot to learn about how best uh, to handle that in the, very, in the months and potentially not as long as nine months to get to Mars and actually do something there. So uh, the moon is part of a program to get to Mars. It, it fits in very, very nicely. It, it's, it's very fortunate that we have a moon in, by which we can learn how to do the things that are going to be necessary in order to ultimately uh, take human beings to Mars. Uh, I've seen uh, images of the new spacesuits that they're planning for the lunar missions, and I didn't know if you'd looked at them. Do you think they look more mobile, more comfortable than uh, the original Apollo ones? Or are they going to have some, I know the problems of walking on the moon or have involved keeping your balance and the gravity is a lot less. So what do you, what do you think about the new spacesuits that uh, NASA's design? That's one area that I have become somewhat knowledgeable about. And my, my impression is that they're going to be more mobile. They're going to be heavier, but the joints are much better than what we have. Uh, and uh, so they'll be more mobile. Uh, there is still an issue of having the glove uh, uh, dexterity that's necessary for human beings to really work uh, efficiently anywhere, much less on the moon. And, uh, and I know NASA is working on that. Uh, they do have a, uh, an issue of a higher pressure in the suit, which means higher pressure in the gloves and more work for your forearm muscles in order to move the fingers. Uh, but uh, there, they, there certainly is a major effort in NASA now uh, to move that forward. Uh, it, uh, it is, uh, is something that's uh, obviously on their plate and they're working on. And uh, I, I wish them well and, and great success because without a, a highly mobile suit and, and buried and, and dextre dexterous gloves, uh, it is very difficult to be very efficient in exploration on the moon. Well, I was wondering if you'd like to comment on uh, commercial mining of the moon. I mean, as far as do you see industry perhaps in the future getting involved with mining resources and, and their helium-3 or even rock resources? Do you think there's a commercial aspect to uh, going back to the moon uh, for private industry? Well, I, I don't think that uh, you will ever get a, a significant amount of resource production on the moon without involving uh, commercial companies that, uh, that can actually make a profit in doing that, uh, either by selling back to the government for resources that are needed for use in space and on the moon, or by bringing helium-3 back to Earth in, uh, for uh, both power and medical applications. Uh, so, uh, yes, I think it, it's essential that commercial activity be involved, and indeed it is. There are many groups that are looking at how in the world can you make a commercial lunar endeavor profitable. And uh, I have great confidence that our, our free enterprise system will uh, ultimately solve that problem. Well, I'm sure you want to wrap up soon. We have a question that just came in from Robin Slocum. And again, this goes back to robot or man. And I know you have some strong opinions on this. Uh, because right now we're doing robotic exploration of Mars and really finding out quite a bit. But uh, what is your balance? What is your opinion on robot exploration of the moon and, and man moon missions and uh, the risks of man moon missions versus, you know, using rovers? Well, everything we do uh, as humans is involves risk and you manage that risk. 
and you accept those risks that uh, uh, you can't manage and you go forward. Human beings have always done that uh, from uh, millions of years ago to the present. Uh, I, uh, I think the balance is that uh, rovers uh, are best used as precursors and postcursors uh, to human exploration. The human brings uh, experience and brain and efficiency to uh, geological exploration and exploration in general that robots just can't do. Uh, it takes a long time for a robot to op be operated telerobotically uh, on Mars. Uh, it doesn't mean that they, a lot of things can, can be done, but the, a robot can only do what it is designed to do. Uh, and uh, human beings can act extemporaneously and, and and when they encounter the unexpected, they're able to handle the unexpected far better than any kind of robot can do. But a precursor uh, to help planning, plan human activities and a postcursor in order to go back and, uh, and gather information, new information about something that was discovered and that there was not time enough to examine uh, closely, uh, that, that is the balance that I see as best between humans and robots. Well, I guess we'll wrap it up. Just, I'm sure you get to ask this question many times, but is there anything you wish you could have done on your mission? And you did a lot, and it was one of the most successful missions of taking back samples and traveling distances. But, I mean, have you ever thought, was there something you could have fit in one more thing on the Apollo 17? What would it be? Oh, another day. <laughs> I would have loved to have had another day. And, in fact, the lunar module could have provided another day of exploration. It's just that there was a trade-off between taking scientific experiments uh, uh, and, uh, and having uh, the time to do another day of exploration. Well, so if you, had, if, you had the other day, if you had the other day and you opened the door of the capsule, would there have been a direction you would have gone, a rock you would have gone back to? I mean, you got any thoughts? Well, knowing, knowing what I know now, I think there are two things that you would have tried to do with another day. One is, uh, to go back and spend more time at Shorty Crater uh, with the uh, pyroclastic deposit. There were there's still major questions that uh, could be answered by a little bit more field time uh, at that point and some, sam uh, some additional samples. The other thing is to go back to the North Massif and look at as many uh, large boulders that have rolled down with boulder tracks as possible to refine the stratigraphy of the impact uh, ejecta that is exposed in the North Massif. Those are two pure geological questions that uh, another day uh, could have provided a great deal more information about. We have one more question from an AAPG uh, person. Is there a place on Earth that you trained on that you think is very similar to the basalt you saw on the moon? Is there a place on Earth where you could touch the most similar basalt that you, that you found on the moon? No, not really. Uh, the main thing the training on Earth is do is just to expand your experience base in observation and, and decision making about sampling. Uh, we really don't have any terrestrial uh, locations that, uh, that are comparable to what you're going to encounter on. Well, that's understood. I appreciate very much your time okay. and the attention and the questions are great. Uh, we look forward to seeing everybody uh, soon when uh, things open up a little bit more and, uh, and particularly want to thank uh, Linda, you and Charles for putting this whole thing together and allowing me to talk with your wonderful group. Well, I'm sure we'll get a lot of good feedback. I'll just, it, it, people in the audience, if you have additional questions, can you send them to me and I'll send them to Jack and he'll answer them if he can. So, uh, yeah. so just send, send them to my email and we'll send them on to Jack if you'd like to take a look at them. And I thank you so much for agreeing to be on this program with the Houston Geological Society. And we're still going to have Field Trip Fridays in the future. The next Field Trip Friday is next Friday. We're going to go to Death Valley in Nevada. And so that sounds like fun. <laughs> hey, Jack, thank you. I, Linda, just Jack, thanks for everything you've done for the geoscientists, for APG and HGS in particular. And I put on a special shirt today. <laughs> never never <laughs> stop exploring. So, we really appreciate you, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Look forward to seeing you soon. All right. Thank you so much. We're ending the meeting now. Thank you.